Welcome. Today we pray and reflect on how our, inter our collective faiths guide us in addressing the intersectionality of income, inequality, and racism. My name is Maria Elena Perales, and on behalf of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, I welcome you to today's public witness. First, we will begin with prayer. We will then follow by personal testimony, and then a litany, and then we will close with reflection and action. Today, we are honored to partner with the Orange County Interfaith Network. They are joining us today in hosting today's public witness. I will now turn it over to Mike Penn, board president. Mike. Thank you, Maria Elena. Uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, uh, joining with the Sisters of St. Joseph in this uh, uh, witness this morning. I'd like to introduce some of my fellow board members, beginning with uh, Natasha Wong. She is the OCIN fellow and a doctoral student at Claremont School of Theology. Ariel Hyatt, is the Director of Faith and Community Relations for Habitat for Humanity of Orange County. Reverend Karen Stoinoff is the retired Universal Universalist, Unitarian Universalist, excuse me, Karen, a minister and also a member of the Board of OCIM. Fareed Faruqi is the founder of the Universal Heritage and Cultural Center and a board member of OCIM. And lastly, we have Gagandeep Mankur Secho. She is the program director for Orange County uh, Interfaith Network. OCIM is hosting this witness this morning to show the commonality of all faith and their relationship with the social justice issues that the Sisters of St. Joseph's are bringing forward today. Our opening prayer addresses the interfaith component to these social justice issues. And to begin uh, with our opening prayer, I'd like to turn it over to Natasha. Will you pray with me? O oh, great spirit of God, whose breath gives life to the world, we begin by acknowledging that the lands we are on originally belonged to the indigenous peoples of Southern California, the Ahachaman, Juaneño, and the Tongva, Gabrieleño. Our many faiths lead us to have a different perspective on who is most important in our society. As the Christian tradition states, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven, of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. We reflect on the words of the Buddhist leader, Shinjo Ito. To be able to help others, we need to put ourselves in their place. We begin by trying to understand them. Then we try to see things the way they do. That effort will show in how we interact with them. And that is when our sincere intentions will be felt and received wholeheartedly. we recite a prayer from the Sikh tradition, from the scripture of Shri Guru Granth Sahib Ji, Ragori Ravidas Ji Ke Pade Gori Gowari Ekonkar Satnam Karta Purk Gurprasad Begam Pura Sehra Ko Nao. Begam Pura, the city without sorrow is the name of this town. There is no suffering or anxiety there. 
There are no troubles or taxes on commodities there. There is no fear, blemish, or don't downfall there. Now I have found this most excellent city. There is lasting peace and safety there. O oh, siblings of destiny, God's kingdom is steady, stable, and eternal. There is no second or third status. All are equal there. There is lasting peace and safety there, O oh, siblings of destiny. God's kingdom is steady, stable, and eternal. That city is populous and eternally famous. Those who live there are wealthy and contented. They stroll about freely, just as they please. They know the mansion of the Lord's presence, and no one blocks their way. Says Ravidas, the emancipated shoemaker, whoever is a citizen there is a friend of mine. We seek wisdom from the Islamic tradition to give to the near of kin his due and also to the needy and the wayfarers to not squander our wealth wastefully. We pray for the embodiment of tzedakah from the Jewish tradition, recognizing the poor as our relative, expressing mercy accordingly, and committing to sustaining our community accordingly. And drawing from the Unitarian Universalist tradition, we acknowledge that the world now has the means to end extreme poverty. We pray we will have the will. Now we invite Ariel to share your story. Hi, uh, my name is Ariel Hyatt, and I am the Director of Faith and Community Relations at Habitat for Humanity of Orange County. I'm going to start a little bit with my background and experience. Um, I have spent the last 10 years of my life devoted to ending homelessness and poverty throughout Southern California where I first found my passion and this intention and this place that God is calling me to was at the Union Rescue Mission in downtown Los Angeles in Skid Row. Um, I was born and raised in La Mirada, which is right at the border of Los Angeles and Orange County, and definitely a suburban community. So in every way, I would consider myself privileged. So at my first exposure to extreme and deep poverty on the streets of Skid Row, I realized that I had to do something. And I started mentoring children um, who lived at the Union Rescue Mission and who were experiencing the streets in a way that I couldn't even understand. And these were some of the strongest and most um, full-hearted people that I had ever met and that I still have the privilege of calling my friends today. As I grew into that, I ended up starting a nonprofit that worked with the chronically homeless here in Orange County. I realized that I could drive down to Skid Row every day or I could also simultaneously do something in my own community. And I did because there was need right on my own street and there was need right in the neighborhood and community that I shopped and eat in regularly. So as I started to understand homelessness and I started to understand what it meant for people who were living in poverty, I recognized that generational and intergenerational poverty stri strikes millions of people across our country. And that's what really turned me to the mission of Habitat for Humanity. And it exposed me to the privilege of home ownership and the privilege of having wealth passed on through generation because while yes, I was raised in a household where we did own a home and that I did have the privilege of going to school, my neighbors didn't have that. My neighbors didn't have that same luxury. And I started to get curious as to why. Why was I blessed enough to have this um, fate handed to me 
while my neighbors right next door were not. And so I have devoted my life to understanding that. And what I've come to realize is that there are a lot of policies that have been in place for generations that are still impacting us today. Where I'm gonna to turn to my notes for a second. Um, Habitat for Humanity was founded because um, once, once slavery had ended, it was still penetrating our communities because racism still existed. So yeah, sure, by law, people were not being held as slaves, but throughout communities, people were still being treated as such. And so in, you know, in the 1960s, we saw the, um, sorry, I, I really shouldn't look at notes. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm terrible at looking at notes. So let me just speak from my heart. So in the 1960s, we saw the Fair Housing Act. But by that time, there had already been so much segregation that occurred and that there were so many people who had been forced into living in slums and living in ghettos, and those ghettos still exist today. Orange County, California, only 1% of our population is African American, and that's not by mistake. That's because of policies that were in place that in created the suburbs of which so many privileged Americans were able to live. By the time that we started to see racism not hit home quite as much and people starting to embrace and start to build community and end segregation, housing was far too unaffordable for people to move into these suburbs, um, especially minorities, people of color, and those of lower income who are hardworking individuals who just couldn't get the income together. So we have seen so much hit our minority community, so much hit our, our lower income communities that today they don't have the, the means of building wealth for their families. And because of that inability to purchase homes in um, suburban communities and that inability for them to actually gain access to home ownership, we have directly impacted their ability to transcend wealth onto the next generations in their family. And so we're seeing poverty be perpetuated from one generation to the next. And that's due to the policies that have been put into place. Um, we have made quite a tremendous progress since the 1960s, but there is still so much more to do. Um, there is an incredible amount of injustice that has been done throughout generations. And a lot of that injustice has created um, financial injustice, health injustice, and housing injustice. And what we're working on today and what we're doing today truly does make an impact for 50 years down the line, which is far too close. Um, so it is so important to us. I, I love that we've seen the movement of Black Lives Matter. I love that we're, we have had over the years like Occupy LA and Occupy Wall Street. These are great initiatives, but it is more than just showing up and saying we need change. It's really about, okay, where does the change begin? And it begins at home. When you see an affordable housing development coming up, and it is important that your voice is heard because as much as we like to think that um, NIMBY, not in my backyard, doesn't exist, it truly does. Um, as an advocate in the homeless community and housing community, I'm always baffled because I'll put blog posts or social media comments out there and I'll get people's responses saying, well, if you quit handing out free stuff to the homeless, they wouldn't be homeless anymore. And I think about that in a similar sense of racism and how people used to talk about people of color. And in today's society, we're talking about people with lower income in the same essence. And so it really starts at how are we talking about these issues? What are we doing to mobilize and educate ourselves about these issues? And how are we ensuring that the community that we live in is not segregated? Because Orange County having 1% African American residents is a shame. And there, and there is something that we can do. But the more that we just sit back or the more we just show up and protest, that is great to have our voices heard, but that's not the solution. We have to take it to the next step. And so I have been able to witness lives transformed by individuals such as myself, such as my friends and the people I love to surround myself with saying, I'm gonna mentor um, a homeless student or an African American community that has been struggling on how to advocate for the resources they need and that they deserve and finding those partnerships to make all of that possible.
while again, I am not necessarily somebody who has been impacted by housing injustice, I will say that because I wasn't directly um, impacted by it is why I'm so passionate about it because it doesn't make sense to me why I was so privileged and why somebody else wasn't. And then as I started to look at the policies in place, I realized that I can do something and I should do something, and that it's only up to each of us individually to make sure that our voices, is, our voices are heard and that we do whatever it takes to make sure that we live in a just and safe world for everybody. So thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm sorry I didn't share my notes and the facts and statistics, but I have a lot of incredible resources and data. A few points that I would reference is my love for the book Color of Law. Um, that's an incredible book. Um, In the Mist of Plenty, which is about homeless services. Um, and there is a lot of really great articles and information out there about racism um, and financial and housing injustice that occurs all throughout our country. Thank you, Ariel. You have shared some powerful testimony, your own story, your experience. We are so honored and grateful to be able to hear from your perspective. Um, and uh, of course, we, we look forward to um, being engaged ourselves and we appreciate the uh, opportunities you've given us to, to take action as well. Thank you so much. So now uh, we will move to our other portion of the prayer. Guided by the wisdom of many faith traditions, we affirm the dignity of all people and recognize our role in loving, accompanying, and advocating for our neighbors. We pray now for our brothers and sisters who are experiencing homelessness, that they be acknowledged, supported, and assisted with the resources needed to transi transition to a place they can call home. And may we all say, May it be so. We pray that we see people experiencing homelessness as our brothers and sisters and understand that being homeless does not define the person, that we allow our compassion heart rather than a stereotype attitude to reach out to them. May it be so. We pray for all who may be economically impacted during this time and are in fear of losing their homes. Guide them so that their financial situation gets resolved and their family remains protected. May it be so. We pray for policymakers to institute policies that include affordable housing, social programs, living wages to allow for struggling and hardworking families to remain in their homes. May it be so. And we pray to work toward advocating for just laws and policies that protect rather than alienate our most vulnerable brothers and sisters who are usually people of color, including immigrants. May we find ways to make them feel included and welcome. May it be so. Now we have the opportunity to introduce Farik, 
He will lead us into reflection and action. Thank you, uh, Sister Maria. Sister in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. We now have an opportunity to reflect on what we have heard. Let us pause, take a deep breath, and reflect on the following. What thoughts or feelings arise as I reflect on this history of racism and housing inequality in our nation? What is it, God, that you are calling me to do about our economically impacted brothers and sisters in fear of losing their homes. Here are some are possible ways to be involved. From now until July 20th, we can help make housing affordable and more attainable for our vulnerable brothers and sisters. Let us call our legislators and urge them to support Senate Bill 899. We can learn more by visiting the Southern California Association for Nonprofit Housing website. Let us get involved in the Habitat for Humanity. Cost of Homes campaign and learn how to address the racial disparities in housing and also how historic housing discrimination against Black Americans contributes to racial inequalities today. Thank you for being involved. God bless you. Thank you, Farid. So now we turn it over to Mike. I want to thank my uh, brothers and sisters uh, on the OCIM board. I want to thank the Sisters of St. Joseph for this uh, opportunity that they've given us to collaborate with them in this uh, public witness. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, we will be putting these on at uh, 10 o'clock every Thursday morning. And uh, later today, uh, this program will be recorded so that you can view it at your uh, when you have time. That being said, I'd like to thank uh, again everybody for their help in putting this on, and the Sisters of St. Joseph and Maria Elena. Thank you very much for uh, allowing us to uh, be with you today. And thank you everybody for joining. Thank you. Great work. Thank you everyone. Thank you. It's been a pleasure praying with all of you. God bless.